Yeah, hi. So I'm Thomas Blomson Christensen, and uh, I'm from Denmark. And uh, my kind of claim to fame is uh, my sneezes and the tracking I've been doing of my sneezes since 2011. So today I'll kind of reflect on the question of what's in a sneeze, and it's quite a lot in my <laughs> opinion. So. Just to give you some data from uh, 2016, this year I've been sneezing 160 times so far. It's probably not over, but uh, the kind of the main grass pollen season is, has just uh, passed. So this is a, uh, a chart of uh, my sneezes uh, since uh, 2011. I started in uh, early May 2011. And uh, this is the total count uh, of all the sneezes. And as you can see, the first year, it was like 400 plus years. And then uh, the next year, it was more than a thousand sneezes. And I have done talks on why that might have happened and what the things I did in the following years to, to kind of avoid it. So you can tell that uh, last year was a really great year. And uh, 2016 looks uh, really promising too. Um, so here's a different way of uh, visualizing my data here. It's a heat map of all the sneezes. And you can really tell that there are some hot spots during the grass pollen season. And uh, that's a kind of an interesting thing this year, too, in the sense that if you look at this particular day, the 28th of May, that day I sneezed more times than I did in any of the days last year. And I have some hypotheses about that too. That was in New York City, it was around 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, I had to go on the subway several times and there's something down there in the subway, in the air, that makes my system much more sensitive to, to grass pollen. And the, the grass pollen was at, its, uh, at its high, uh, the height of the grass pollen season in New York City and that particular day. So that particular day is like 30% of all the sneezes this year. And this is another way of showing this data, which is a cumulative uh, diagram. So you see, in all, I've sneezed 2,879 uh, 2, times since the 1st of May in uh, 2011. And this kind of showing it cumulated, you can see how it kind of builds up, and you can see how it's really concentrate during the grass pollen season. I don't sneeze that much uh, during the other parts of the year. And you can tell too that 2016 isn't really amounting to much, right, compared to like the two first years. So this is uh, taking the first year, 2011, and then superimposing 2016 to just sh kind of show the difference. Uh, the different uh, dynamics and how much uh, less I'm sneezing. But uh, that's another reason why I picked the first and until now, last year, and that is that there was, this year was almost like a replay of what I did in 2011 in terms of geographical movement. So let's look at that. So. In 2011, I started out in New York City. I was some time in Copenhagen, uh, went to New York, and then Silicon Valley. That's actually the first quantified self-conference in Mountain View. And that was where I started feeling the first symptoms. Uh, then we went back to New York and Copenhagen and northern part of Denmark and see how it seems like when I was exposed to kind of pollen that my body knew from my childhood, then it really had a reaction. But I had reactions in Silicon Valley, in New York, and then in Denmark that year. And this year, it's almost the same geographic movement. So I started in Denmark, went to Silicon Valley, uh, to uh, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, and this, this was the day in New York where I sneezed a lot, right? And then I went back to Denmark. As you can see now, my reactions are much less fierce than they were uh, five years ago. So of course, there's a, there's a big question here, what is sneezing good for? And as I can tell, uh, the mainstream immunology doesn't really have a good answer for that.
And already when I started out doing this, I, I had to come up with a hypothesis and models around why are we sneezing. And uh, my idea originally was that probably the body is trying to get rid of something. And th there's one immunologist called Metsitov, and he's, he's got this idea too that it's about expulsion. And uh, then you would expect certain dynamics of this phenomenon if sneezing is um, about expulsion of the pollen from your nose. And um, my original idea was that there's probably some kind of process like this going on where the, the pollen is building up in your nose. It reaches some kind of threshold. And then you have sneezing in order to get rid of this pollen that has been building up. And then you can have buildups also, uh, you know, later during the day, you might not reach the threshold level and then you, then you might not start sneezing. And that's one of the basic models that I've been working uh, uh, based on this model for, for many years now. And um, I've done an analysis to kind of look at could this be evidence in favor, in my da data evidence in favor of this interpretation. And this is a uh, is, is an analysis where I've looked at if you take a sneeze and then you take the previous sneeze over here, then you measure the time distance between the sneezes. And um, like the, the two sneezes that are most apart, they're like 10 million seconds apart, and that's around uh, three months plus. It's like 100 days or so. And then you see it's really clustered down here towards the zero. So if we kind of zoom in, here's another way of looking at it. So I put some uh, pink uh, lines in there, uh, purple lines, and uh, those lines are like saying, okay, so I have these 2,800 sneezes since the 1st of May in 2011. So what if they were equally distributed and spaced in time? That would be the, uh, the rightmost line. Okay. I, I don't record sneezes while I'm sleeping. So let's uh, deduct uh, eight hours a day. That's the second line from the right. Okay, we could look at the accumulated graph and tell that I'm sneezing mostly during the pollen season. So let's say we only do four months, and that's this line, and then we deduct the, the sleep. And still, it's all clustered in here. And the thing is that most of my sneezes happen within uh, less than 15 minutes of each other. So it's like there's no sneezing and then suddenly there's a burst. And that's what I believe is the evidence of this idea that it's, it's not just this stochastic process running all the time. There might be this mechanism where you have a build up, the body detects that we are over the threshold value and then it instigates a sneeze attack. So I'll tell a little about some of the learnings that I've, uh, that I've had over the years, and it's kind of like going from yeah, personal things of, about tracking and what Jake and I we're working on right now, going to like the quantified selves. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, I've been very active about is active self-tracking because I've been recording these sneezes myself. Um, and what uh, Jake and I kind of arrived at in our reflection on this is that the important part uh, or important thing about active self-tracking is that your consciousness is part of the instrumentation. It's not about that you're writing things down or using an app or that it's more cumbersome than just having passive centers registering things. The important thing is that you can use your consciousness as part of the instrumentation. And there are certain, certain phenomena where we don't have any passive sensors for yet. And then there are some phenomena that we only can track using our consciousness, like mental phenomena, like sensations in our bodies. But, but there's a... There's kind of like a, an issue here. So I've made more than 100,000 observations uh, using active tracking and a lot of other stuff than, than the sneezes. And estimated, it's taking more than 500 hours just pulling out a smartphone, unlocking it, opening an app, making the observation, saving the observation, putting the smartphone back in my pocket. So the thing is, even smartphone apps 
are just too cumbersome. The technology wasn't really ready for it. What I've been doing is, is not normal and it's kind of crazy, spending that much time on making these observations. So uh, Jake and I, we are now uh, starting to develop and have developed technology for making observations of these subjectively perceived phenomena using wearables instead, where we can uh, make observations much, much faster and much easier. So for instance, just using a button or using a smartwatch. So I'm instrumented, so if you want to see some, some, uh, some technology, you can just come to me afterwards. Um, then we have started talking about N of ones, uh, studies and experiments uh, uh, in the quantified self community. And I just wanted to kind of pose a warning against a naive way of approaching N of one. So people are talking about a crossover design where you kind of take the same kind of design that you have for a randomized controlled trial and then you do it sequentially on yourself or one person. It kind of, that model is kind of too simple for me and uh, the whole kind of thinking and what I've been doing over the years in the sense that what's going on now is dependent on what happened in the, his in the, in the history of my system and which state I came from and which state I might be going into. So I thought, I'm thinking these kind of state spaces that you use in engineering, so I thought I would I just find this uh, mission profile for the Apollo Moon program to kind of explain how I can think about this. So my idea, basic idea is that I started out as a kid, I was orbiting the Earth. Then there was something that made my, my system transition into the allergy state. And that's orbiting the moon. And I stayed there for like 30 years until I started thinking about what could I do to kind of transition back to Earth orbit. And that's really what I've been working on since like 2008. And that kind of challenges that model in the sense that when I've been transitioning back to Earth, it's a different state I come from. So if I take the same intervention that was helpful while I was in orbiting the moon, so to speak, when I had allergies, and then I do it uh, half a year, a year later, orbiting the Earth, what can I infer from that result? Because the whole system state has changed so fundamentally that that uh, it might look as if the intervention is not working. But actually that intervention might have been the one that was crucial in transitioning into this other part of the, of the, uh, the operating regime. Yeah, thanks, it's perfect. Yeah, so now I'm taking something completely different from where I've ever been with the quantified self and it comes from some of the uh, realizations I had after the QSEU conference in September and uh, Gary and I, among other people, we talked about quantified self and art at a bar uh, late night after the conference. So I, I started thinking about you know, my uh, bachelor in musicology and what I was reading then and there was this particular text by uh, Walter Benjamin, the German philosopher which uh, was probably the most inspiration to me then. And um, I, um, I started thinking about the confined self in terms of, uh, of what Benjamin had said. And what he said was that one of the foremost tasks of art has always been the creation of a demand which could be fully satisfied only later. And with some, as I see with all the experimentation we've been doing in quantified self, we've kind of been stimulating something where, you know, that demand wasn't really there yet. And then he says that the history of every art form shows critical epochs in which a certain art form aspires to effects which could be fully obtained only with a changed technical standard. That is to say in a new art form. And I see kind of like my own self trying as an example of that in the sense that it has been crazy. You know, collecting 100,000 observations using an app, a smartphone app, even is an, is an effect, as, as, uh, as Benjamin said, it's an extravagance, it's a crudity. It's just, it's something that wasn't really there, but, but uh, I tried doing it anyway. So I think there might be some parallels here between 
uh, artistic movements and uh, technology and what we have been doing in the quantify itself. So that was one of the other thoughts after the QSEU was that we've been talking about quantify itself as early adopters, but I think actually the, the, the concept of the avant-garde is much more suitable. Because if you read this definition from, uh, from Wikipedia, it says the avant-garde are people or works that are experimental or innovative, particularly with respect to art, culture, and politics. And then this thing, the avant-garde pushes the boundaries of what is accepted as the norm or the status quo. And I've been feeling that myself, doing myself, you know, insisting on taking pictures of my food at a wedding in Wisconsin, for instance. Stuff like that is like, in a small scale, pushing the boundaries of what's accepted. So I think we haven't been the early adopters to quantify itself. Uh, uh, we've been the avant-garde, and the early adopters still perhaps come later. Um, so this is like a very kind of overall kind of learning about the quantify itself. Thank you. I just can't resist Thomas saying thank you. Like I'm, I love your talk, and also for some reason I've also been reading, rereading Walter Benjamin lately. Wow, <laughs> this is very interesting. And also, you know, he was a collector, mm -hmm. and yeah. he has a beautiful essay on what it means to be a collector. And I, I recall that people have said, "Oh, quantified self." It's just a bunch of people who collect things. Yeah. <laughs> and how fascinating. I mean, this is that, that we both found our way to this unlikely source. So I think there's so much work right there. Thank you. So it seems like a health question coming up. <laughs> it, 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 I'm just wondering whether you've done something to lower your uh, amount of sneezes or that it happened and you figured out or haven't figured out why it lowered. Yeah, so that's what, what you call a really good question. <laughs> so I, can, I, I, I kind of I removed some stuff from this presentation that was already, already too much. But in some sense, you could say that I've been, I've been kind of using some kind of strategic interventions and then some tactical ones. So on a strategic level, I've tried using changing diet and, and routines and stuff to try to kind of nudge my system into a different state. And then I have some tactical interventions that I can, I, I can use like when I feel an impending sneeze attack. And it's been very efficient this year. I use water to, uh, to, uh, to lower the risk. So for instance, I've, uh, I use this neti pot to uh, rinse my nose, but then you know, this summer particularly, I always carry a small bottle of water, and when I feel a tingling in my nose, I start sloshing water in, in my mouth, and that's kind of been able to prevent most sneeze attacks this year. So actually, I, ha I have a new problem now, which is I've gotten so good at preempting sneezing that in order to capture some data, I might need to kind of go back to the precursors of sneezing. So the next project might be to track my tingling in my nose, because now I'm so good. Well, you know, or kind of, uh, kind of urging myself into other kinds of data. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you.